想，此刻种感觉，全世界离我鼓掌，不必太在意。Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Alice from Beijing. I'm so glad to meet you on IKX and this, you know, very early of 2022.、Uh, and this is a Happy New Year、uh, warm、uh, message from IKX Talks. And、uh, I'm in Beijing.、Uh, Beijing is cold winter, but in the whole world, there are some places with a warmer summer, like in Australia.、Uh, so. Uh, Beijing is in the evening. I think somewhere was the sunrise. Somewhere even before sunrise, two or three a.m. in the early early morning. So that's the internet. That's the online talk. So we connect the world and universe.、Uh, we hope everyone can enjoy this very much. And、uh, I'm so proud that we have I can act. You know, since、uh, COVID nineteen,、uh, we're beginning of COVID nineteen and April seventeenth.、Uh, so that time we start this talks and every Friday,、uh, the same time as now, eight p.m. in Beijing and three、uh, p.m. or four a.m. in、uh, LA. So、uh, the whole world、uh, in different time zones. So、uh, in last two years, we continue this、uh, science talk. So we have、uh, continuously have the talk and the eighty-two weeks.、Uh, the speakers and the audience from five continents, and、uh, we have thirty、uh, countries and the regions. The speakers involved, and、uh, we have a hundred fifty. Uh, six speakers、uh, totally. You know, since the very beginning, that's really large numbers,、uh, and、uh, we have、uh, many, many、uh, audience. We're so proud of that. We have turned、uh, over twenty millions, you know, audience from the whole world. So this I can act talk like、uh, my great friend, you know, Paul Weiss say that is already become a phenomenon. Yes, somewhere. So this is not one man's job, one lady's job. It's a teamwork. So I'm so proud that I have, you know,、uh, three of them, you know,、uh, together with me, you know, to make all these things happen. So my great friend Pavis. Uh, you know, now it's early morning. Even you know, be, uh, uh, two or three hours before sunrise. And、uh, in LA, and、uh, my great friend Professor Jack Fish now、uh, is already midnight、uh, in Australia. And、uh, Martin was、uh, in the middle of uh, US. Uh, it's early morning too. So the four of us team together and uh, uh, to do all the jobs. I think the last two years you see many times of the of this face, and、uh, they really hard work and do a lot of jobs on this.、Uh, give them a big hands. And、uh, we are so proud of、uh, all of these efforts to connect the world and the universe. And、uh, now it's a new start, right? Two thousand twenty-two. So、uh, everything will be new. Everything will be, you know,、uh, have more fun on this. I can actually talk the stage. So what's going to have? So first of all, you give you a big surprise. Let's welcome our new partners.、Uh, Professor Fu Lan was from Australian National University.、Uh, Professor Fu Lan is one of the leading scientists in the whole world.、Uh, first, uh, let me uh, give me a few minutes to read his uh, uh, outstanding、uh, resume. And、uh, Professor Fu Lan is currently a full professor and the head of the Department of Electronics, Material Engineering, and the Research School of Physics at Australian National University. Her interests include the design, fabrication, and the integrations of optical electronics,、uh, electronic device, and、uh, based on the low dimension materials. And、uh, <clears throat> He did a lot of things.、Uh, published many many papers, more than two hundred publications, three book chapters, and co-edited five conference proceedings, journal special issues, and holding two U.S. patents. He has、uh, delivered more than thirty invited talks, and、uh, he was、uh, served as a program committee and the chair and the co-chair of a thirty international conference,、uh, including many famous conferences here.、Uh, we're so proud of that. 
And uh, uh, Professor Fu Lai is a senior member of, our, of IEEE and IEEE Photonics and the Electron Devices Society, and was the past chair of the Photonics Society, uh, Electron Device, uh, Devices Society, and the Nanotechnology Council chapters of IEEE sections. Uh, she is currently the chair of IEEE Nanotechnology Council chapter and the Regional Activity Committee, associate editor of IEEE Photonics journals and a member of the uh, 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 editorial board of Opto Electron uh, Advance. Uh, so uh, it's a big name in these fields. And the full line is the current uh, members of the Australian Academy of Science and National uh, uh, Committee on Material Science and Engineering uh, Security of the Executive Committee of Australian Material Research Society and the Australian Research Council College of Experts. He was a uh, recipient of many, many awards. If uh, at least all of them here will be takes, you know, the whole evening to read about it. So that, yeah, we're so proud of you and uh, we're so uh, great to have you. Please. Thank you very much, Alice, for your very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I would just like to say here, it's a great pleasure for me to join the big family of ICANX Talks and also to be the co-host um, of my eminent colleagues. So I'm really looking forward to working with everyone to make ICANX an access, a success in 2022 and beyond. Thank you very much. Okay, okay we're counting on you, so let yeah, uh, so I have all my colleagues here, especially Professor Jagdish. Uh, so, Professor Jagdish, can you say some words to Fulan? Thank you very much, Alice, and uh, so welcome to Happy New Year to all of you, and then also Happy Chinese New Year, which is going to be soon. And uh, so it's great to see that Iconix uh, has been, talks have been so successful. It's been a great pleasure for me to work with my colleagues, Alice and Paul and Martin and Lan Fu. And then we've had great uh, speakers and we want to thank all the speakers for really sharing their knowledge with the uh, younger generation because the future of uh, science and future of the world is in the hands of the younger generation. And it's really important to inspire the younger generation and Iconics talks are really inspiring the younger generation. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope all of you participate in 20, 2022 talks as well. Okay, thank you, Professor Jagdish. I also uh, want to say appreciate to all your efforts and all your work in past two years. Uh, I can ask, you know, you really, really amazing person. And uh, congratulations for your new position, the president of Australian National Academy. We hope, you know, in the future can see more and more, you know, uh, contributions from uh, your side and we can collaborate together too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so my colleague is Paul. Yeah, so in the early morning, four o'clock or three o'clock, Paul, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, 4 a.m. here. So welcome to Professor Lan Fu and thank you Jagadish for all your help and congratulations on this new position. We're really, uh, we're really extremely proud of you. And of course we won't let go in any way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, Paul, uh, thank you. Yeah, now we have uh, our colleague, Martin. Yeah, Martin. Welcome, uh, uh, thank you very much, Iris. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Lanfu. It's great to see you on board and uh, we're really excited to have you and to work together and especially to engage the Global South in uh, on this platform and even and bring more uh, uh, women into, into the platform. So thank you very much for accepting the challenge and looking uh, forward to working with you to make this even a better platform. Thank you very much. Okay, so Martin, thank you so much. And the land, yeah, now you already got, uh, you know, some kind of specific job. Yeah, need to get more female scientists to get on the stage, okay? Yeah, the uh, land, today is your first day, is your big time. So yeah, please, yeah, now stage is yours. Thank you very much, Alice. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to the audiences of ICANX Talks around the world. First, Happy New Year, and welcome to our ICANX Series 83. This is also the first talk um, in 2022. Um, it's a great pleasure for me today to um, briefly introduce our distinguished speaker today, 
uh, Professor Ji Feng Ren. Professor Ren is an MD Anderson Chair Professor of the Department of Physics and the Director of the Texas Center of Superconductivity at the University of Houston. He received his uh, Bachelor in Science in 1984 from Xinhua University and his master's degree in 1987 from Huazhong University of Science and Technology and a PhD in 1990 from the Institute of Physics, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Professor Ren has a very long list of achievements and honors, including being ranked as the 49th of the world's top 100 material scientists from year 2000 to 2010, and also being one of the highest cited researchers in physics in 2018. Um, his research interest spans a wide range of materials and applications such as the thermoelectric materials, the superconductors, catalysts, and a variety of nano nanomaterials and nanostructures. So today he will be talking about nanostructured thermoelectric materials and the boron arsenide single crystals. And Professor Ren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen and get the uh... Uh, presentation started. So can uh, can you see the slide now? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, first, let me uh, thank uh, the ICANX platform for this opportunity to uh, present uh, to the scientific community of the research work we have been doing in the past a, a few or some of the work in fact is more than a few, uh, probably 10 years. And uh, uh, especially thanks to uh, uh, Alice uh, for uh, the invitation. And also I have to be honest, uh, uh, also thank uh, uh, Dr. Chan Fei Go uh, who suggested uh, me to Alice for the presentation. Thank you, uh, uh, Chan Fei. And uh, my talk today will be uh, nanostructure thermoelectric materials and the boron arsenide single crystals. Uh, you may wonder why these two topics are uh, in one talk. Uh, well, uh, they are sort of uh, related. Uh, in a way, thermoelectrics, we are pursuing very, very low thermal conductivity. <clears throat> but on the other hand, uh, boron arsenide single crystals, we are pursuing very high thermal conductivity. So basically it's at the two ends of the spectrum of the thermal conductivity. So as has been uh, introduced, I'm from University of Houston uh, Physics Department. And uh, first, let me also thank uh, all the uh, hard workers who did the work uh, on thermoelectrics. I have a lot of former students, former postdocs, most of them are uh, professors uh, either in China or in the United States and also some other countries. Uh, and uh, for the uh, boron arsenide, the single crystals, uh, I also have a former uh, postdoc students. Uh, they are again, either in China or in America. Also, I would like to thank uh, Professor David Bruido and his group uh, so, uh, because of his prediction of the high thermal conductivity of boron arsenide, and uh, which is why we can give the talk uh, for the second part. Of course, uh, Professor Gang Chen, my longtime collaborator uh, and uh, best uh, one of the best friends, uh, we have collectively published uh, over two hundred papers and. Uh, Another group I have been uh, actively collaborating with is uh, Professor Shini at UT Austin uh, on uh, both thermoelectrics and also for arsenide. And uh, now uh, let me just uh, uh, briefly show you what my group is currently doing. Uh, one is up, up in thermoelectrics. In thermoelectrics, we are pursuing not only high ZT for higher efficiency, but also high power factor for output power density. And then this uh, thermoelectric materials, so we are mainly pursuing uh, cooling and power generation. And then for the uh, high thermal conductivity materials, uh, we are not only pursuing the very high thermal conductivity, and uh, recently we found the ultra high uh, carry mobility. And uh, this is uh, boron arsenide single crystals, uh, which is very interesting. Normally, 
you wouldn't expect a high uh, thermal conductivity nor high uh, mobility because of the uh, big atomic mass difference. And then my group also has been studying uh, new materials for enhanced oil recovery, especially uh, we discovered a nano uh, sodium nano fluids, which will generate a lot of hydrogen gas, uh, heat, and also sodium hydroxide. All three are very much needed for the uh, oil recovery, uh, either to reduce the viscosity of the oil or to increase the pressure of the uh, oil fields so that uh, we can have larger sweeping effect and get more oil out of the ground. Even though I know uh, clean energy is the future, uh, but uh, before we reach the promised land of clean energy, we still have to uh, go through this bridge by this old uh, fossil fuel uh, energy. And then the other topic my group has been doing is an efficient catalyst for especially uh, water splitting, not only fresh water, but also seawater splitting where the fresh water is, uh, is not uh, too uh, abundant uh, for the clean uh, energy source hydrogen. And then uh, back in 2020, uh, at the early days, uh, April, when pandemic uh, uh, it really started to happen in the United States, uh, I have helped a company, local company, designed and uh, made, manufactured a new kind of filter and also mobile system to catch and kill the viruses so that uh, uh, the air we uh, breathe in, either in buildings or uh, in schools, hospitals are very clean, free of the virus. In fact, those mobile units are uh, being used by many schools, uh, uh, hospitals, uh, some of the schools have reported back to us saying that they have never closed a single day of school and then nor had a single uh, transmission, uh, COVID transmission cases uh, since uh, the starting of the pandemic, which is really interesting. Uh, that, and also, of course, uh, being the director of the Texas Center for Superconductivity, uh, superconductivity is also one of my uh, current research uh, fields. Uh, this is the current research field. Of course, I have done uh, a lot of other works before, like carbon nanotubes, and uh, which uh, I didn't list here. But uh, due to the time limit, what I'm going to talk today is really focus on these two areas. It's a thermoelectric materials and also the ultra, the born arsenic single crystals. So. Let me first give you a uh, very uh, preliminary or uh, fundamental uh, view of the thermoelectric devices. Uh, thermoelectric devices is very interesting. Uh, it's a semiconductor, uh, both N-type and P-type. Uh, the uh, dimensions of the device could be very small from anywhere, uh, a few microns to a few millimeters and uh, it's uh, the solid state without any moving parts. If you have a heat source, you can generate electrical power. Uh, and the war, uh, if you have, you apply electric power, you can have two fundamental physical uh, physics phenomena, uh, either co cooling on one side, the other side you, you get uh, uh, hot, which is a heat engine. So basically a thermoelectric device is very versatile with three functions, power generation, cooling, and uh, heat engine. And the efficiency either for the power generation or cooling, uh, or cooling is a factor of the Carlo efficiency here. And uh, uh, the, fact, the factor is related to so-called the thermoelectrical figure merit. And uh, this thermoelectrical figure merit uh, is uh, related to say back coefficient, electric conduct conductivity, and then thermal conductivity. Uh, this is dimensionless uh, with the temperature there. And uh, obviously, as you can see uh, from the uh, efficiency formula, only when ZT goes to infinity and then you reach the Carl efficiency of the traditional either uh, heat engine or the uh, cooling uh, refrigeration. And then the obviously the uh, 
So far, it's not infinity uh, number, but a very small number. And why is it so? That's because these three uh, para physical parameters, they are interrelated. As we know, CBA coefficient is inversely related to the carrier concentration and also uh, is related to the mobility and also the energy uh, density and then energy uh, distribution. And then here, as you can see, electric conductivity, we would like to have high electric conductivity, but then the high electric conductivity requires a very high uh, carrier concentration, which will reduce the uh, CBA coefficient. Uh, and the thermal conductivity, it's very unfortunately related to two parts. One is the electronic part, one is the lattice part. In fact, uh, this uh, electronic thermal conductivity also related to uh, electric conductivity here. And now you can see this ele electronic, higher ele electric conductivity, higher uh, electronic thermal conductivity. Uh, really, uh, the lattice uh, is the part we are going to uh, work on to reduce it as much as possible. Uh, in fact, we would like keep the uh, electronic thermal conductivity uh, as high as possible. That's how it should, it should be done. Uh, and then this is very challenging uh, scientific topic. And uh, this started, it was started in 1821. It's uh, just 200 years old uh, scientific topic. It's amazing normally uh, you don't, uh, you have uh, a scientific topic after 200 years, still very hot and uh, we are still pursuing. Over the many years, the first uh, a little bit over 100 years, not much progress until 1950s, uh, last century, uh, middle last century, uh, when people realize that uh, we have to have a compound instead of pure elements to significantly reduce the thermal conductivity so that we can get higher, bigger merit somewhere close to one. After that, and then ZT stayed at that uh, value for over another many, many years until uh, the late uh, Professor Mide Dresselhaus at MIT realized that the quantum effect is the way to go. So that very quickly uh, in the next few years, people have demonstrated uh, super lattice like bismuth telluride, antimony telluride can have higher ZT, much higher, like 2.5. And also the quantum dot super lattice, uh, late telluride, late cellulite, uh, has ZT also above 1.5. And at the same time, also bulk, nanostructure bulk material has been demonstrated over ZT, uh, uh, demonstrated ZT over two. All those uh, higher ZT drastic development uh, incre uh, increase is because of the nanostructures significantly reduce the thermal conductivity. Well, the, all those super lattice way, it's not possible uh, to make uh, hundreds of tons of such materials for the demand of the application, uh, obviously. So therefore, how do we learn from those super lattice work and then move into bulk material for uh, large scale application? And then we came out a way uh, to do that, but before, I present you uh, the way I would like to present you the challenges of the thermoelectric materials research. And uh, normally thermoelectric materials, even though it's materials, but it requires material science, physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, uh, a lot of other uh, knowledges, uh, even uh, economy. You probably wouldn't think economy will not play a role here, but it does. And then, the other challenge is uh, a lot of uh, scientific topics. You have you you study one physical parameters, but here thermoelectrics you have to deal with uh, say back coefficient, electric conductivity, thermal, uh, electronic thermal conductivity, lattice thermal conductivity, carrier concentration, mobility, uh, band gap size, you know, uh, which is a semiconductor versus semi-metal uh, band alignment, uh, which uh, determines the number of degeneracy. There are many physical parameters. It's not just one or two or three. There's multiple, uh, so which is why uh, it's very challenging, very difficult. And also the uh, figure merit uh, is not directly measured. You cannot directly measure it. It is a measure many of those uh, individual parameters and then you do a calculation. 
And if you may measure multiple parameters, of course, each parameter has a certain error. And at the end, your ZT will have a much bigger error, which is why uh, just uh, the ZT number, uh, you have very often you have to find other ways to uh, try to verify whether it is that high you, you are reporting or not, which is why the device, the device measurement is important. And then, of course, during the study of thermoelectric materials, as I pointed out already, ZT uh, is uh, closely related to efficiency, uh, but the power factor is very important since power factor is very closely related to power output, not the ZT. And for any device, we won't have um, as many watts as possible, which is why we need a very high power factor. Of course, uh, ZT, there is the peak ZT versus uh, average ZT. Peak ZT, high peak ZT is good, but not good enough. Uh, we need a very high average ZT. And then pursuing high ZT, of course, we pursue very low thermal conductivity. Uh, but it's the thermal conductivity does have a limit because the device uh, reliability uh, is related to total thermal conductivity. And of course, uh, we would only like to make the net thermal conductivity close to zero as possible uh, as we want. But the uh, electronic thermal conductivity has to be as high as possible so that we have high power factor. Uh, and also uh, higher output of power. That's what we needed. And of course, uh, for thermal electric materials, it requires both N-type and P-type. Uh, not every material are equal. You can make into both N and P. Uh, Bismuth tenorite is one of the few materials you can make both N and P. Uh, the properties are uh, pretty much uh, close to each other, but other materials like magnesium, silver, antimony, only P-type so far. And uh, other, uh, like the uh, magnesium antimony zental materials, uh, N type is better than P type. Uh, of course, uh, the scarudite is another material, P N type is uh, uh, better than, than P type. And then we have to uh, worry about the matching of the uh, these two, both N and P materials, because each type has its own, all those parameters, and this parameters has to be where they matched. If they are not matched, then you are going to have a problem during the device assembly, uh, which is why uh, we have to look into that. And of course, uh, when we look at ZT, ZT is a product of Z and T. Uh, and uh, for higher T or lower T, for higher T, which is for power generation, for lower T, which is cooling. And if you have a ZT high, regardless of the T, and then uh, you can uh, either do it as the power generation or uh, as the uh, cooling, uh, that's very important. And also uh, when you look at the uh, market of the thermoelectric devices, there are uh, two markets. One is the existing market, and then also you, say, uh, you want to open the new market that like power generation. Uh, the potential of the market is huge, but it, uh, there's no not uh, many devices are in the market yet. On the other hand, the existing market for cooling is a billion dollar market, which I'm going to talk about more later. And of course, a uh, lot of people are focused on the materials DT, uh, not really on the device. In fact, from materials to device, there's still a very long way to go. Uh, there are many more challenges in between. Uh, which uh, I will talk about later. And then, of course, uh, when we start any materials, there are bulk versus uh, a film. And uh, film, even though you could have very high ZT, uh, but uh, so far the Delta T demonstrated by the film uh, is not even as uh, good as the bulk. Why is that? Uh, which I'm going to also talk about in more detail later. And of course, there's contact thermal electrical resistances. Contact resistances is really your big uh, enemy. You have to reduce it, otherwise uh, your power generated will be lost at the contact. And uh, obviously, uh, when you do materials, you want to publish it as soon as possible. But when you are doing devices, uh, very often, especially the contact related uh, knowledge, you want to keep it as a secrecy. 
because it's too close to uh, making money. Uh, that's why people keep it secrecy. Uh, so how much detail you report is very challenging. And at the end, of course, everything uh, depends on uh, really uh, what is the economy uh, dollar per watt and also the lifetime, okay? So uh, learned from the Supernatus work, we came up with this bulk, uh, so-called nano structure, the bulk either particle in matrix or particle with particle a composite. Uh, that was, uh, uh, this idea came out uh, between my discussion with uh, Professor Gang Chen at MIT back in 2003. So we, uh, uh, ever since then, and, uh, most of the people in the thermoelectrical uh, community now are pursuing this con concept in fact. And of course, when you talk about a nanostructure bulk, uh, you have to also look at a notch scale manufacturing, uh, not just laboratory uh, sample half inch or quarter inch sample size. You have to talk about hundreds of tons per year. So we came up with this bow mini uh, process, which uh, is a industrial uh, process. It can handle hundreds of tons of materials per year. And uh, very easy. So you have the, either the alloys or the, uh, the alloys or the elements into bow mill jars. These jars could be uh, in the lab, very small, uh, 25 milliliters, and in the industry could be many uh, gallons or many cubic meters uh, size uh, for uh, milling. And then through mechanical shaking, and then after some time, you get the powders uh, very small, uh, down to 10, five or uh, nanometers, okay? So our first demonstration of the, uh, of the method technique was on bismuth uh, antimony telluride because this material, as I pointed out earlier, uh, maintained the ZT at about one over 50 years. And uh, we were thinking, <clears throat> is it possible we can demonstrate this technique in this material uh, with much higher ZT? Yes, we were uh, uh, lucky. We found that we were able to improve the ZT to uh, the peak ZT to 1.4 at about 100 degrees C. Use this material pair with the end time material, we were able to demonstrate the cooling. There are T86 uh, when the hot side is 50 uh, degrees C. The reason for uh, this is because of the uh, thermoelectrophical memory drastically increased. This is the bulk material, this is our nanostructure material. And uh, you can see the ZT has been increased over, improved over the whole temperature range. And many, uh, the improvement comes from the uh, thermal conductivity decreases bulk. This is the nano, uh, obviously, and uh, without too much uh, interfere with the power factor, as you can see here, power factor at room temperature, both bulk and nano, uh, it's about similar, uh, 40, uh, 45 in that range. And, and in fact, the nano structure material at higher temperature has even higher power factor, which uh, is very good uh, for the some low temperature with heat recovery uh, for electrical power generation. So after this, and then we were uh, thinking, you know, uh, when you have the P-type, you definitely also would like to improve the N-type. And we tried that to improve the N-type uh, but N-type is a little bit different from the P-type. The reason is because N-type is very much uh, anisotropic, not like the P-type. And so the N-type, if you do the regular hot press, uh, doesn't matter is uh, in the uh, press direction or perpendicular to the press direction, uh, the texturing is not there, uh, just one press. But then if you, uh, but the property is not that uh, good. So then we're thinking, since this material is it's a layered material, if you further uh, texturing, you could have better property. And that's what we did. Uh, so for the non-textured one, the iso, iso uh, and the satropy is not there. And then for the textured one, now, as you can see, if you do a, another hot press, uh, let the uh, AB plane to be more aligned in the perpendicular to the press direction. Now you can see those L0, L peaks are 
much more prominent than the other uh, direction. So which means that you have much texture in like here, the microstructure to you. But unfortunately, this texture one, and now the property indeed uh, in the plane, you do have higher uh, ZT, but out of the plane, much lower ZT. So now <clears throat> the, due to this, and you saw, and the, I, I saw such a P, and then they makes the contact uh, fabrication the much more difficult, which is why we were not, not able to uh, massively uh, notch scale commercialize this business, improve business uh, telluride both A and P uh, because the contact issue is uh, the good direction is in the other direction, uh, which we cannot make contact. Uh, other, uh, uh, than that, and then we also have uh, uh, the uh, look. We uh, saw the lot of uh, activities in the thermoelectrical uh, community, like here, uh, Kaladadis Mercury Kaladadis group, and uh, demonstrated natelluride has very high uh, ZT above two at a temperature at above 600 degrees C, and that's very wonderful. Uh, but uh, the thermal conductivity mainly is because of the very low thermal conductivity, not because of the high power factor. And then later on, uh, as we understand, it uh, is a uh, toxicity uh, issue. <clears throat> so people, uh, low one in the industry, really want to get into uh, toxic and lead uh, into a large scale application. So then, Li uh, Dongzhao, uh, right now in China, and came up with this new material, tin selenite, uh, which does not involve lead anymore, reported a P-type first, and it was very high ZT uh, above 2.5, uh, even though the uh, ZT at lower temperature uh, is not good, but later on, uh, different ways uh, reported to improve the ZT. <clears throat> so maybe the average ZT uh, much better. And this material, interestingly, also uh, different directions has also very low uh, thermal conductivity. And then after the P-type, they also succeeded in 2018, uh, the N-type of uh, t uh, also the T uh, close to three even. And uh, uh, this is, again, it's because of the very low thermal conductivity. At this low thermal conductivity, really uh, we are going to have a serious problem with the device uh, lifetime. And uh, so we have to be uh, very careful uh, in this. So as I said, uh, for thermal electro materials, we want to pursue high ZT, but it, uh, not just to be, just to really make the thermal conductivity uh, extremely low, but really would, we would like to pursue very high power factor. So that is a natty thermal conductivity goes to uh, I like it, close to zero, but the electronic thermal conductivity has to be high. And then luckily we found one such kind of compound, half poisoner, which is a uh, tin <clears throat> doped titanium, sorry, titanium doped niobium iron antimony. And uh, with a different amount of uh, titanium dopant. And then we were able to get power factor over hundred at room temperature. Uh, this is outstanding. Uh, the reason is because if you can reduce the thermal conductivity uh, down to one, that kind of level, and then your room temperature, ZT should be above, uh, close to three. But unfortunately, so far, we have not been able to reduce the thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity at room temperature is still somewhere 15, 10, between 10 and 20. That's very high. And uh, we are still studying this and hopefully uh, many of you today in the audience will have some idea, try to uh, reduce uh, the thermal conductivity to much lower level so that this material really not only uh, will be useful for power generation, but also useful for cooling, okay? And this power, high power factor, as I said, uh, it's based on the individual measurement. And we did also measure the actual power uh, density uh, based on the power factor and also calculated and this power density is about uh, 20 watts per square centimeter. And uh, this is very large in a sense, if you compare with the solar, uh, solar photovoltaic cells, 
And uh, the power density is only about 0.02 watts per square centimeter. That's about a thousand times uh, lower than the thermoelectrics. Okay. And then uh, the other half poison materials for power generation, another one very interesting is the zirconia cobalt bismuth, which is a, a work uh, jointly uh, with uh, obviously with, uh, with the Gang Chen's group and also here uh, with uh, Cornelius Nielch in Germany, dressed in Germany. I'm currently uh, in Dresden, in fact. And uh, the reason for this high performance is because of the engineering of the band uh, alignment. The cobalt, uh, zirconium cobalt bismuth has. Uh, multiple bands are uh, very well aligned at the edge of the uh, valence band. Uh, not like the uh, zirconium cobalt antimony, which is not well aligned here, nor titanium cobalt antimony. So because of this well alignment of the band edge, we have many more uh, number of de degenerated states, uh, so which will give you higher performance. This is from calculation point. And, uh, and then experimentally, we did prove uh, this zirconium cobalt uh, bismuth with some dopant has a very high ZT at about uh, 600 uh, degrees C. Uh, we got ZT uh, close to 1.5. Uh, um, the average ZT is uh, better than the previous uh, half poisoners. Uh, this is probably is going to be very promising material for future power generation at a hot side temperature close to 700 degrees C. Okay, and then uh, very last few years, uh, uh, another new material, the Zento material, very interesting. Uh, before Ta uh, Tamaki and Panasonic reported this end type, people have studied uh, Zento as P-type thermoelectric materials for quite some years. And uh, in fact, they almost get the conclusion that it's not possible to make uh, N-type Zento materials. So that's why the uh, interest for the P-type Zento uh, later on uh, become uh, lower and lower. Uh, but suddenly, uh, Tamaka reported it, not only N-type, but it was very high ZT. Uh, ZT a peak ZT is about 1.5. When we look at this, we got very excited. And uh, however, when we look at the electric conductivity or here electrical resistivity, which is still 10 uh, million uh, centimeter, uh, normally uh, you would like to have one million centimeter. So we immediately saw that, well, maybe uh, we can improve the ZT to much higher number value uh, by more uh, dopant uh, optimization. Which is uh, here we reported the paper in PLAS uh, back in 2017. And we used uh, a lot of other elements like iron, cobalt, hafnium, tantalum to uh, partially reduce, uh, replace the magnesium. And here is the uh, magnesium only. And then here are replaced. As you can see, thermal conductivity, all of them uh, got reduced. And the, the uh, power factor maintained also improved a little bit. So the ZT over the whole temperature range improved from room temperature to high temperature. So with that, we got, of course, uh, uh, higher average ZT, also higher engineering ZT, which uh, will give us uh, a better uh, performance. But nevertheless, uh, Zento was later on uh, discovered. It's not stable. Uh, even the material, if you leave it in room temperature over a few weeks, and the property degraded uh, because probably lots of defects and also probably the uh, migration of the magnesium. And of course, now we understand uh, all sorts of issues. So at that time, we were thinking maybe we use a much less magnesium and then we can use some uh, other elements as a pinning center, sort of pin the defects or pin the magnesium to prevent it from uh, leaving the lattice. So that's why we uh, found that the e trend worked very well. We get uh, the material much more uh, stabilized at uh, at least a three or to four hundred degrees C range. As I uh, already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, thermoelectric materials measurement is very challenging. 
Very often, if you want to measure the ZT, you have to make the contact, and the contact resistance has to be very, very low. Otherwise, you don't measure the same performance from your uh, individual calculated ZT. Uh, in this situation, making contact to any thermoelectric material is very challenging. So that means uh, it's not possible to measure the performance, either efficiency or power output, uh, if you don't have a very good contact. So we, that's why we have to find a way to, to avoid that issue. Obviously, for uh, uh, people doing electrical resistivity uh, measurement, they use the four probe uh, to avoid the contact resistance. So in this situation, we came up with a also four probe uh, method to measure any materials without making any contact. And then we found that, that it can really accurately measure the uh, efficiency so that if from the efficiency we can back up uh, the back out the ZT and to see whether it matches with the uh, calculated ZT from the individual properties. It does. Uh, here, as you can see, uh, not only measure the, uh, the power uh, efficiency ZT and also we measure the the power factor and the uh, here shoes output power very close to the calculation from the individual uh, properties. That means this four probe method really works. And then for efficiency measurement, in fact, you don't have to have four probe. Only the top uh, hot side you need uh, two probes, and then the cold side one probe uh, is fine. And then the efficiency measurement is also quite close to the calculation. And uh, for this situation, like example we got the efficiency uh, around 12%. That is very uh, useful. So now let me come back to the current status of the thermoelectric materials. Uh, you know, the power generation uh, are still being developed. There's no big market yet. And the only market is uh, so far is the NASA uh, for uh, outer space missions. They use a uh, radioisotope for thermoelectric material. Uh, devices to provide the power for uh, the, uh, the mission. Some of the devices has been working there for many, many years, over 50, 60 years. And uh, the obviously uh, high temperature uh, materials, high ZT, give you high ZT, but that material is really not useful for cooling. And of course, uh, uh, the power uh, generation for high at high temperature, there are many other challenge issues like thermal stability, uh, thermal barriers, uh, contact resistance, mechanical strength. When the temperature is high, as you can see, all sorts of issues uh, is going to be uh, working against you, uh, not like the cooling applications, okay? And uh, uh, so, so that's the, the current uh, thing. Now, in fact, the cooling has a current market. Uh, in 2008, uh, the market is about $300 million. 2018, uh, doubled the market is $600 million. And it was uh, predicted by 2025, a few years later, the market will be close to $2 billion. It's a sizable, not as big as many other markets, but it's a quite sizable market. Uh, 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 already. And then the current day, the cooling market is really based on only the P-type, bismuth and telluride, and also the uh, bismuth uh, telluride, uh, telluride as N-type. Well, uh, with the market growing, the demand for uh, the material will be much larger, and especially the tellurium. But the tellurium uh, on Earth, there's no tellurium mine. Uh, tellurium is a very minor element, a component of the copper mine. And the price could be fluctuated very much from anywhere less than $50 per kilo to more than $300 per kilo. Uh, that's because uh, uh, if you have much higher demand, the price goes up very quickly. Uh, a few years ago, the price went up very quickly is because of the uh, solar cell, uh, copper Indian uh, telluride uh, six, as a solar cell demand there, and then drive, uh, drive, uh, drive, drove up the price to over 300. But now it comes down already. Now, if the market for thermal electric is very large, and then this price works for sure go up. So is it possible we can find other replacement 
uh, replacement is for maintain the price. Yes, uh, we did find the magnesium bismuth, uh, both elements are uh, very abundant, ours, and so the price is very low as n type to replace bismuth telluride uh, for uh, much at a much lower uh, cost. Okay, and uh, this work. Uh, was reported uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, 2019, uh, this new material. And then we use this new material paired with the traditional bismuth mass antimony uh, tenorite P-type. We uh, generated uh, the uh, a Dera T91 Kelvin uh, when the hot side is maintained at 350 Kelvin. And which is uh, demonstrated, proved that this is a uh, a material can replace bismuth uh, antimony, uh, bismuth telluride for as n type. And here is the demonstration we use this uh, uh, magnesium bismuth uh, n type and the traditional uh, bismuth antimony te uh, telluride as p type and it did the cooling. And as you can see here uh, with uh, the Dera T, this is a hot site uh, at a uh, little bit higher temperature. Uh, 350 degrees C, the Dera T is over uh, 90 Kelvin. And at the lower uh, hot side, and it's uh, comparable with the commercial bismuth uh, telluride. Uh, the reason for a larger Dera T is because uh, uh, magnesium bismuth and uh, telluride, the ZT goes up with temperature, but the traditional bismuth telluride, uh, selenide, uh, ZT really comes down with the temperature. Okay. And this material is very interesting. The intrinsic material, it's really a semi-metal uh, because uh, the band gap is very small and then the mobility uh, at uh, the room temperature, uh, it's, it's uh, increased a lot, uh, but not that high. The end type is, uh, you know, uh, it's not that high. And the resistivity is also by a little bit doping of tellurin, and also uh, later on, uh, we uh, worked out uh, some uh, antimony doping. Uh, the reason for this uh, very high performance of a similar metal is because we did uh, mobility, uh, electron, mob electron versus hole, it's very interesting. Well, this material is very large, uh, larger than, than 10, which is why I gave you very high sayback coefficient. And uh, so uh, with the further optimization with some antimony, we opened up some gap and it gave us a uh, uh, gap even with uh, 0.7 antimony and the gap is still very small, only uh, less than 0 0.15. And of course, uh, the ZT of this material at room temperature uh, is about 0.7, 0.8. That is very much comparable with the uh, bismuth telluride. And uh, so uh, obviously we want to, as I pointed out, thermal electric materials, you need hundreds of tons of materials. Scale up is the issue. And uh, we have been studying how to scale up the input materials from the traditional quarter, a half an inch. We went all the way uh, to uh, you know, uh, two inches, uh, one inch or two inches of material. And this is a one of materials uh, one inch, we studied the uniformity of this uh, scale up. And then we cut the sample at different uh, locations and then we measured the property. It seems that it's pretty uniform. And even from the two inch sample, uh, all the individual properties are pretty much consistent with a very small variation. And then we also uh, measured the uh, different uh, regions of the uh, disk for the thermal conductivity here. And then also the electroconductivity. You can see different locations, and then the electroconductivity, thermal conductivity, they are pretty much consistent. That should demonstrate the uniformity. And also uh, each sample, uh, different lengths of sample from different locations, and they are very, very much linear. That means they are very uniform. And then in order to make a unit couple, we need to have both N and P. As I said, we use the traditional. Uh, bismuth antimony telluride as a P material, which has a larger electric conductivity. The new N type material has lower electric conductivity. Uh, the, at the end, uh, the ZT of the uh, traditional material, the new material, uh, they are comparable uh, within fairly uh, range, a wide range of uh, temperature. And then 
uh, we did the contact. Uh, we showed that the contact resistance is pretty small. Uh, it's only about 2.5 micro ohm square centimeter and uh, without too much uh, interdiffusion at the boundary of the contact and the thermometric materials, uh, which is good. And then we did the measurement of the uh, efficiency and then output power. Here shows you the efficiency is uh, at about 9%. At the hot side, it's only 300 uh, Kel uh, degrees C, which uh, uh, really prepared this material for low temperature heat source uh, recovery. Now I'm gonna use a, a rest uh, 20, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, talk about the high thermal conductivity uh, in boron arsenide. And uh, thermal conductivity, as I pointed out uh, earlier, thermal electric materials, we pursue very low thermal conductivity. But then for other applications, we do want a very high thermal conductivity, like the thermal management for electronics, uh, electronic devices. <clears throat> Uh, traditionally, as we know, uh, diamond has high thermal conductivity, but uh, diamond is so expensive uh, and also has many other issues. And thermal conductivity obviously has two parts, as I pointed out, electronic, phononic, and uh, electronic part is a, uh, very much related to uh, electrical conductivity, which is why like copper, silver has very high thermal conductivity due to the very high electrical conductivity. Uh, and uh, diamond has very high thermal conductivity due to the lattice part. And then the phonon, the lattice part is very much related to uh, specific heat, uh, group velocity, and also mean free pass of the phonons. And it really uh, much the mean free pass, of course, is uh, related to the, uh, the, uh, the, free, uh, the time frequency, uh, all those, uh, those issues. And the high thermal conduct, thermal conductivity, uh, traditionally by snacks rule, uh, has to have materials, very simple structures, and uh, no anhydricity, and also very low atomic uh, mass. Uh, otherwise, you don't get uh, uh, high thermal conductivity. Of course, the crystal structure has to be uh, cubic, very simple, and a very strong bonding between the uh, atoms. And, uh, but uh, no one, was able to demonstrate uh, other materials with uh, uh, high thermal conductivity. Diamond, you see, it's carbon, simple, that is. And then in the past, uh, high thermal conductivity materials are nice at point of diamond. The silicon uh, has uh, isotropic thermal conductivity, 140 something. Graphite uh, or carbon nanotubes, uh, they have high thermal conductivity, but only either in one, uh, two dimensions or in uh, one dimension, uh, not uh, isotropic, uh, which were limited its application uh, drastically. And other materials, as I pointed out, copper, silver, uh, it's somewhere in a few hundred. Between diamond and uh, those uh, isotropic materials, there are a huge gap uh, between 500 to like over 2000. So is it possible we can discover other materials with high thermal conductivity? So very luckily, uh, my former colleague, uh, Professor David Brudel <clears throat> at Boston College predicted early on boron arsenide could have thermal conductivity as high as diamond at above room temperature. And also some other, a few other materials like the boron phosphide also the thermal conductivity, it's not too bad. And why is it so is when he found from the phonon uh, uh, dispersion, he found that the boron arsenide has a very interesting Phonon dispersion, optical uh, phonons and then acoustic phonons. They have a very large gap here. And also the acoustic phonons, they bundle together. They have a bunchy effect. And uh, two phonon, acoustic phonons energy cannot reach the optical. So that's why they reduced the, the phonon scattering drastically. Uh, because of that, uh, they have this high thermal activity. And this is a theoretic prediction, uh, no experimental, uh, really experimental work. And then before we started to do this, we want to prove it, and then we look at the literature and we found one article back in 1950s, last century, and uh, uh, many years ago, and they made a cubic boron arsenide. 
they gave this uh, even the cubic uh, the lattice parameter, uh, and then that's all. The whole paper is is this uh, just a quarter a page, uh, the short paper, reporting the crystal structure, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, that that's basically it, and then that is parameter, and then after that. Uh, many years, there's no single, uh, another single report back until 1970s. And uh, they tried to uh, make a single crystal, tried to, this is 3.5, at that time, they are pursuing 3.5 crystal. And then they were looking at the band gap, they found the 1.46 EV, and also they found the mobility uh, somewhere at between 100 and 400. And the thermal conductivity is very low. They were even not me measuring thermal conductivity because their uh, intention was try to study the semiconducting behavior of this material. So after that, there's no other paper about experimental work on this material. And then, so that means this material must be very difficult to make. And then we look at uh, the details, why it is so difficult. Obviously, boron has a very high melting point uh, over 2000 degrees C and it was chemically very stable. On the other hand, arsenic does not have a melting point, but a sublimation point at about 650 degrees C. And it was a very toxic, very volatile. And uh, of course, if you, uh, want to, you, if you want to use boron, the other sources, either diborin or arsen, but they are very toxic. Uh, one PPM is going to kill you. Uh, that's why you got to be very careful with these two sources instead of a solid uh, source. And so that boron arsenide itself also has another property, very interesting, is it decomposes at above 920 degrees C uh, into boron uh, uh, 12 arsenic uh, form. And uh, that's why chemically uh, it's not stable above 900. So which, because of this, uh, makes the crystal growth temperature cannot be above this, because above this, you are not deformed this form. Uh, this uh, composition. So therefore, uh, it's, it's, that's why it's difficult. Uh, but nevertheless, we tried different ways and especially the vapor trans chemical vapor transport, we were able to grow crystals a few millimeters and then uh, found they are indeed single crystals. Uh, most of the planes are uh, 111 uh, plane, uh, which uh, uh, give us the property later on we did a measurement looks like some crystal looks like this. And then first uh, we were doing a lot of optical wave measurement and then later on we tried to transport because optical wave can give you very uh, precise thermal conductivity at the local region and the transporter will give you the uniformity of the uh, property. Then here we use the one, uh, use a reference sample silica it will characterize that has a thermal conductivity. And then with our boron arsenide sample uh, connected, and then you have a heater, heat passes through, uh, sit inside a vacuum chamber without uh, radiation heat loss, and also the temperature uh, kept it very uh, low, the hot side, uh, not that much difference from the, uh, the heat sink side. So then we can uh, assume all the heat go went through the silicon and where it also goes through the boron arsenide. And they say they can, everything is, uh, uh, re, is known, and then we can calculate the sample uh, thermal conductivity. So here is a summary of the thermal conductivity by different ways. There are uh, uh, TDTR measured, FTTR, uh, and then the Raman even also measured and also transport. We found the boron arsenide at room temperature as a thermal conductivity somewhere around a thousand, uh, between a thousand and then 1200 uh, watts per meter per kilo. It's not 2000, uh, over 2000 yet, but at that time, but uh, uh, much higher than the, uh, the numbers of other materials, which is very exciting, uh, which made us uh, to further improve the growth. And then we did uh, grow some other bigger crystals. Uh, this crystal, what we found is we use a bar with a nucleation site uh, seed. This is a quartz bar and put in a quartz tube and put it here. As you can see, one piece of the crystal grow out of the bar, probably like this one, and then perpendicular bar grow, grow, and when touched to the quartz tube, 
and then they cannot uh, grow, uh, uh, go anymore, and only this part, which is why this uh, quartz tube inner diameter is only six millimeters, but this crystal, the longest dimension is seven millimeters. So we found some crystal growth mechanism, and then this is obviously also a simple crystal. And then with that, we grew many other uh, crystals with uh, uh, quality, some of them very high quantity like here. And with that high quantity uh, crystal later on, uh, back in 2018, Gang Chen's group predicted this material born also not only has high thermal activity, but also has very high mobility. Uh, and his uh, calculation showed that the electron mobility uh, is over 1400 and the whole mobility is over 2100. And then the and bipolar mobility should be somewhere close to uh, you know, a little bit over 1600. So that's the calculation. And then and later on, they took our crystal and did the measurement. And they did found that at a different spots and have uh, and bipolar mobility 1600. And then of course, there are some lower uh, value regions is because of the uniformity of the sample. And then another very uh, outstanding property for boron arsenide is the isotopy effect. As we know, you know, uh, diamond uh, has isotopy, very strong isotopy effect. Uh, so is boron nitride. You know, isotope pure boron nitride has a thermal conductivity over 1500, but the natural uh, boron and the thermal conductivity drops uh, below 800 watts per meter per kilogram. But the boron arsenide is very outstanding. Uh, the uh, both all the uh, isotope pure and the natural boron are not much difference. The difference is less than ten percent. This is very great uh, news for future application because uh, the price will be so much lower if it does not require uh, boron isotope pure. Uh, so uh, that's very good. On top of that. Uh, boron arsenide also has another outstanding property is the coefficient of thermal expansion. As you can see here, I'm showing uh, diamond has uh, uh, one uh, times 10 to minus six, and then like boron uh, nitride also close to diamond and uh, uh, gallium arsenide, some other semi, uh, semiconductors. So those kind of high thermal conducting material does not match with the semiconductor materials. However, the boron arsenide does match quite well with a lot of semiconductors. So this will give us a, another advantage for using boron arsenide for semiconducting devices. Uh, okay. And then now there's another slide I want to show you. This gives us a lot of more hope for even higher property. So here we uh, at uh, UT Austin, what they did is they took a crystal and then uh, at the broken uh, surface, and this is a large surface uh, as made, and this is broken uh, surface. And what they did, they measured, they used a scanning probe, measured the semiconducting band gap from near the surface to the inside and then to the other surface. So interestingly, what they found is close to the surface, the band gap is about 1.9 UV. And it goes closer into inside, it's over 2.1 UV, okay? And then the other side become one point, uh, about 1.9 UV again. So this means what? This means on both surfaces, there are lots of defects, which gives, you, gives us the intermediate state. Uh, and then because of those defects, what if we make single crystals, just like the inside, the intrinsic band gap, without defects, so are we going to get the mobility much higher than 1600? Or, and also are we going to get the thermal conductivity much higher than 1300 that we demonstrated so far? Which I believe will. So that is, uh, gave us a lot of hope and hopefully a lot of people will get into this field and then really prove that. So at the end, before I conclude my talk, I want to show you, uh, do a little bit of advertisement of the journal, new journal, uh, still kind of new, even though we started in 19, oh, not 19, sorry, 2017. I'm the editor in chief, materials today physics. 
And then we added an uh, editor, uh, Professor David Sen from Missouri, uh, Takamori from Japan, and Yi Yu from China, uh, Chen Zhang from China, Chuan Fei Guo uh, also uh, in the, uh, China, and uh, Hai Qin China. And then very luckily, recently, we have uh, Professor uh, Cornelius Liuch uh, in Dresden, Germany. And uh, this journal, we have eight of us are uh, working very hard to try to make this journal better, better publish your paper. And uh, how is this journal doing? Uh, the journal is doing uh, okay, uh, not as good as uh, uh, what we wanted, but uh, we are uh, improving, we're trying to get there. The first impact factor in 2019 was 10.44, and the second one came out in 2020 is uh, 9.2, and then uh, a little bit of drop, uh, but uh, the uh, third impact factor for 2021 will come out uh, 20, uh, in June uh, 2022. Uh, I'm 100% sure it's going to be about 10 again, but how much uh, about 10, I don't know, probably close to uh, around 11. And then our acceptance rate, uh, rate is about 20%. Okay, that's this, this journal. But then this journal has a focus, uh, many in materials, electronic materials, functional materials, um, and not so much uh, flexible materials. And then, but recently we found that flexible uh, research engineering has contributed significantly to many journals impact factor. Uh, this is the uh, impact uh, number contributed by the, uh, the papers on flexible uh, electronics and to like nature science, or uh, most of them are uh, positive contribution. So, and then we look at the percentage of those uh, flexible uh, papers uh, and in those journals, very small percentage, like nature science, less than 1%. The highest percentage is the advanced materials somewhere a few percent, none of them is over 10%. So therefore we feel there is a need to have a Another, especially uh, this uh, publisher, uh, and they came up with the idea to some new journal on um, Flexible. And uh, with the help with Haisha uh, Zhang, and uh, we launched this new journal, so-called Soft Science. And uh, in last year, and we are looking for uh, publishing many of your papers uh, in Soft uh, Science on um, Flexible related science and engineering. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude my talk. Uh, let me summarize. Uh, so basically, thermal electric field, even though it's 200 years old, as I pointed out earlier, normally after 200 years, you wouldn't think uh, it's going to be still exciting or challenging. But this field is really still very exciting, uh, very challenging. And uh, obviously, applications need a lot of more attention, effort, and especially uh, the existing market of cooling uh, there can give us, uh, bring us to a much bigger market and also open up the market for power generation. And uh, obviously high ZT is not enough, uh, and, but high power factor is very important for uh, power generation, okay. Uh, no thermal conductivity uh, is not, uh, overall thermal conductivity no, is not good enough. Uh, but we did really uh, looking for no natural thermal conductivity, but uh, a high electronic thermal conductivity so that your power factor is high. And for boron arsenide, this material is very unique. As I point out, not only it has a high thermal conductivity, also it's a, a wide ba wider band gap semiconductor because the band gap, the intrinsic band gap is 2.0, uh, bigger than silicon. And it has not only high thermal conductivity, but it was a very high mobility. And uh, it, the other good property is a uh, uh, very good matching of the CTE with many other semiconductors. Uh, probably there are many other uh, physical properties with more and more study uh, we'll find out uh, will be better than the other semiconductors. So materials physics today, uh, definitely welcomes your papers. Um, functional electronic materials, and then if you have uh, flexible uh, work related to flexibility, electronics, uh, soft science will be uh, the journal to go. And with that, 
I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. And especially uh, for those of you uh, very early morning, I'm sorry about that. And uh, I will stop here, take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ji Feng Ren, for a very, very interesting talk. Now let me um, bring back our panel list uh, for the discussion. And due to the time limitation, I have to say we might have a very limited time. So please coming up with the questions. Okay, maybe I go the first. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, congratulations and uh, really a great talk. We see many, many new things here. And especially for the thermal, you know, uh, this uh, high power density and all these things. Actually, here I have a question is, uh, you know, you have the journal Soft Science, right? Yeah, I was also in the editor and it's also support, you know, for the I can act the rising star. Yeah, thank you very much for this. But uh, for the thermal, you know, uh, these applications, uh, did you think the soft materials have some advantage? I think the thermal maybe uh, the soft materials maybe not, you know, the best candidate for this. Well, the uh, flexible, a lot of uh, nowadays, uh, uh, the flexible devices are very much demanded. And uh, uh, often some flexible devices, you also need the uh, high, higher or lower thermal conductivity. Like say, for example, flexible thermal electric power generator from this uh, human body and then generate the power for your cell phone or your other devices. And you need flexibility, you need low thermal conductivity. On the other hand, and some other flexible materials, you do need high thermal conductivity. So flexible uh, doesn't matter if high thermal or low thermal conductivity, flexible devices, uh, materials are very much uh, needed for many other applications. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Maybe I can ask one. Uh, sure. Many of our trainees like to know what they should do to go into this field. So, you know, based on your talk, uh, backgrounds in chemistry, physics, material science, engineering, and devices all come into play. Which, where do you see the biggest gap in terms of, you know, opportunities uh, for, for new people moving into the field to, to make headway? And in your set of collaborations, who do you feel like you're missing? in terms of fields to, uh, you know, to, to get such uh, materials out into the world? Uh, Paul, that's an outstanding question. And uh, I probably don't have the, the greatest answer you are looking for. And uh, the, for thermoelectrics, let me first uh, say, let's talk about thermoelectrics. For thermoelectrics, as I point out, has been studied over 200 years. And uh, as you can see, it's very tough, as I pointed out. And then it also requires so many other uh, knowledge in different fields. Uh, in this field right now, application is, be, is really lacking. Uh, with so much uh, recent uh, reports on high ZT, if the application doesn't come up nicely within the next few years, and this field, field it will uh, meet a problem again. As you understand, the government uh, funding uh, it's not going to be forever for any scientific field. And at the end, uh, funding is from science to technology and to devices really has to come back to serve the society. So that's why I have been pushing very much more and more application. Uh, doesn't matter is the cooling or power generation. So for people, new people jump into this field and they have to be very careful uh, so, so, so this field is already so-called very, in Chinese, it's, we call it hard bone. It's, there's not, no, not much meat left. It's really hard bone, but it's still very tasty bone. Uh, so yeah, yeah, if you want to jump in, you got to be careful. Uh, but, uh, it, but on the other hand, the bone arsenide is a brand new material. There are going to be a lot of opportunities. Uh, you can see in consideration of the wider band gaps, high thermal conductivity, high power, uh, you know, high mobility. And then for electronics, the, you know, the future, the, it's just unlimited, I, I think. Uh, so I would encourage a lot of people jump in. And, but on the other hand, on the, other hand uh, the crystal grows, you have to look at it also, film grows, 
like uh, uh, MO7AD or uh, due to the high vapor pressure, you probably also should look at the high pressure uh, gross devices that make a very uniform sample. Uh, so that's, that, that's my, uh, uh, my answer. Thank you. Uh, very good. And, and uh, thank you very much for that great talk. And uh, in, in follow up to the last two questions and uh, kind of keeping this discussion, uh, we always know that uh, somebody who doesn't know their history is bound to repeat it. And I appreciate that strategy hard on the history. And looking at that, if the field is getting to what you're calling the hard bone and following to Paul's question and thinking about the, 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 young, <clears throat> the young investigators out there is this a, a, is a field is a point where we need an infraction, somebody to come up with a, a new way of thinking to shift the, the field so that we can get into the uses and application we are thinking about. Just like you showed with the, with the introduction of a, a nano materials and increased uh, interfacial surface area. Do you see a, an, an area, following to what Paul was asking, where maybe the, the, the the use of new thinking could help soften this bone so that it's chewable, so to speak. Yes, uh, there are indeed a lot of out of the box uh, thinking. Uh, you know, traditionally, uh, in fact, this is a new material anti dental material magnesium business. Uh, it's because traditionally it's a semi metal. Uh, normally, you wouldn't think semi metal is going to be a good. Uh, thermal electric materials because of the very small band gap. And that small band gap normally gives you very uh, small uh, setback coefficient. So that's why you have to have other people to completely break the traditional thinking coming. Uh, so which is why also recent years, people are looking at the polymers or uh, inorganic materials for thermal electrical uh, devices. Uh, that field is, uh, in fact, uh, picking up a lot of work. And uh, so interdisciplinary is very much needed. If you are trained only in chemistry or in physics or in materials uh, science, I wouldn't think you are going to have too much uh, discoveries. And uh, you have to learn, especially young people, uh, don't think that your major is physics and in your rest of your life is going to work on a single physics problem. That kind of time already way past, no longer the case. As you, uh, as all of you understand, uh, you probably are not in a single scientific field. Uh, you need interdisciplinarity there. Okay, okay. yeah, may, maybe I add it. So, sorry, Martin, you go first. Yeah, so in follow-up to that, I, I, I just wanted to say I've seen a few papers coming through uh, on this area where they're using uh, tunneling systems instead of classical conductors. So working with self-assembled molten layer, single molecule systems, and they're getting significantly high uh, power factors. And I was curious to see whether there was the need to shift from a classical conducting system or semiconductors to a pure tunneling where you can use coherent tunneling and uh, poor thermal conductivities as a way to amplify your power factor. So thank you very much for your, for your answer. Well, okay. they, uh, uh, recently uh, the low dimensional materials, especially model layer uh, materials are pretty interesting. There are reports with uh, the predict uh, where there are some measurement saying that uh, high thermal uh, electrophic merit but the issue is, is the fundamental research is great, uh, no problem. And then from the fundamental part, how to move that fundamental research to a bigger bulk material. That is very challenging because when you from away from single layer or double layer to bulk, and then the property completely change back to bulk. So that's very challenging. I'm looking at that too. Uh, but uh, it, it, though, though it's challenging, but it's interesting. I think we have to uh, uh, give those kind of opportunity, opportunity to people to further look into more. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe I just uh, additional, you know, to Martin's, uh, you know, uh, questions on some materials. Uh, I saw MIS, you know, in the four meetings. Uh, Gang, uh, Gang Chen or gave a talk was for the hydrogel. 
uh, it even go to the hydrogen for some uh, dynamic, you know, thermodynamic analysis. I think this may be open to many, many new materials or even some material we even never think about it. Yeah, so uh, just, uh, you know, back with Marty. And uh, I, I have the last question for the young scientists. Uh, Jifeng, you have nursing, you know, many, many scientists that you see that they became faculty or even they can uh, set up the companies uh, being very good in their uh, careers. So did you have some uh, secret recipe for how to nurse all these people? Uh, I do not have a secret recipe. I have to say it's a purely by luck. Uh, I have been very lucky over the many years even started from my middle school, college, graduate school, and was a postdoc in the U.S. And even now, I have so many other great people try to help me. I'm just the luckiest one I fear in the world. And uh, it, it is uh, many things when I started to get into it, I didn't see uh, a very bright future. But then when I get into it, uh, somehow, uh, with the greatest, uh, some of the greatest students. Uh, we were, some of my colleagues complained they don't have good students. I said, I, I told them, I said, I don't have bad students. I'm lucky. Thank you. Okay. That's a very good. We will say that we never have bad students. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a very good, I guess, uh, conclusion of our talk today because of the time limit. But thank you very much, uh, Professor Ren, for a very nice talk and also very insightful um, you know, comments on, on our questions. Um, thank you very much. And um, here are representing um, ICANX talks. Uh, of course, as usual, we'd like to present you a certificate. Over here, oh, so I recognize of your contribution to ICANX talks. Thank you very much again, Professor. Yeah. Thank you uh, again uh, for the opportunity. I I, I really uh, feel this uh, platform is just unbelievably wonderful. I was chatting with Hai Xia yesterday for a little bit over an hour, and uh, so hopefully I can uh, work with you, uh, you people, great people, again in the future or a person to meet you or somewhere. I personally feel that the pandemic should be over now, should be completely open uh, because there's no, no worry at all. I'm, I'm traveling, I have been traveling 2020, 2021, traveling everywhere, no problem. I have never contracted, so anyway. Well, you are the lucky one, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. so now is um, a little bit um, mentioning about our um, January talk. So in the rest um, coming weeks, we'll have uh, two, um, three actually speakers, but in two uh, I can talk slots. And as uh, Hai Sham, um, Alice mentioned earlier, we have a topic each week, uh, each uh, month, and the topic of January will be nanomaterials. So uh, next week we'll have um, the uh, big, uh, a very big uh, name in the science coming, um, Professor Constan uh, Constanza, Constantin, sorry, I need to get the, <laughs> the name right. Um, Novoslav uh, from National University of Singapore and he will be our speaker next week. And then the following week, we have two ICANX Young Scientist Award, Award winners, um, uh, Sejong and Shidong, coming to also present their talks. And so please stay tuned. And um, of course, uh, we also have our strong uh, panelists to join the talk next week. So welcome and looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much, everyone.